the taliban jai hind and welcome to def talks a lot has been said and written about afghanistan and the reemergence of taliban in that country many people speculate a complete capture of kabul by taliban and the future of this war torn country in the hands of the taliban with their ruthless ways of work how would the taliban fare in this new adventure of their own to discuss this i have with me two very eminent thinkers and speakers starting with brigadier rahul bhosle an indian military veteran with immense experience in counter militancy and counter terrorism operations the director of sasia security risk.com a south asian security risk and knowledge management consultancy i also have with me lieutenant general sayed ata hasnain pvsm uysm avsm sm vsm and bart vsm former general officer commanding 15 corps 21 corps and military secretary chancellor of the central university of kashmir he is also a very eminent speaker and writer thank you so much both gentlemen to uh, join me on this particular program to discuss the future of afghanistan slash taliban may i begin with my first question so i'd like to ask uh, brigadier rahul sir with the first you know the opening statement of when you see the taliban when you see the statements coming out of the taliban their actions how do you think the taliban has changed have they kind of learned the ways of the world or they are still in their 90s uh, you see the point at issue is any organization is defined by not just the transactions it carries out an organization is defined by the ideology by its culture by the people who are leading it and by the actions on the ground that is being conducted by it now if you look at these aspects of the taliban apart from the transactional engagement that the taliban is conducting in in, the, in doha first they carried out with the united states now there is a perfunctory one with the afghan leadership apart and also they are also trying to engage with the international community a number of countries such as russia iran china and so on pakistan of course they are been engaged quite from the beginning apart from this transactional engagement with the regional and the global communities i see fundamentally there is no change in the taliban their ideology has not changed their actions on the ground their uh, conduct of the operations in the past few weeks and few months for for example what has happened in afghanistan is really uh, has to be uh, condemnable the way they have been massacring the people on the ground the civilians we don't even have the count the, the way they are treating the women in the areas in which they are claimed to have again access and control is something which is i think worth condemning with the very strongest terms so if you look at the taliban holistically i think we must understand that on they have got something what uh, our former prime minister used to very always say a mukhauta that mukhauta is there in doha and what is taliban actually is on the ground in afghanistan ill treating and mistreating the people on the ground causing civilian casualties etc etc so that we should not get carried away by this uh, so uh, so called perception of the taliban wearing nice you know uh, well laundered clothes and patkas and the, the, the turbans and trying to engage with the us and the other countries in doha as well as in other parts of the world that's the way i look at not to mention the social media profiles that they have come up with sir yeah absolutely general hasan uh, coming to you sir you know this speculation about taliban capturing kabul and staking a claim to rule the entire country do you think that is even possible or would they land up in a position where they would want and have to do a sort of a compromise and come into a negotiation where they would jointly form a government of some sort and then thereby do whatever they have to do in their books uh thank you ari thank you for having me on your program uh but let me before i come to your this question let me also just very briefly respond to what uh, you had asked uh, the general bosle uh i may only add one aspect i agree entirely with what uh, bosle has said i may only add the aspect of the origin of the taliban it came out the taliban were the young students who came out of the refugee camps these refugee camps were set up for the 3 million people 
refugees who had come on the other side of the Pakistan border from Afghanistan, displaced from there. And these are where the madrasas, the first time in the world the term madrasa really came up was actually here, right? When it came to be known, you know, these seminaries there and what was being taught there, the whole idea of the spread of obscurantism. So actually the Taliban are carriers of the theology, this theology, obscurantist theology, and uh, they are the first ones who actually went and created uh, uh, or rather uh, governed a state with that kind of a theology. Why should they change their colors? I would say. Why would they change their colors? Uh, the ideology remains the same. What they have done is probably over the last 20 years learned a little bit of diplomacy. Refined their methodologies of uh, communication and communication skills. And therefore what is being presented to the world outside at the moment is a is a Taliban which appears to be very civilized and, uh, you know, uh, in keeping with uh, international standards, etc. But lurking behind that, we, below that, we have no idea as to what is the thought process still existing in the Taliban. What they have already made known with the treatment of women and the way with which Brigitte Hosta has explained, the kind of attitude that they've, they've, they've shown towards, uh, in, in their war fighting, the manner in which they have handled prisoners, for example. Those 22 prisoners from the special forces of the uh, Afghan um, uh, National Army, how were they handled? They were, they, were, they were just shot in cold blood. So to my mind, they haven't really changed. Nothing has changed as far as the Taliban is concerned. Now to come to your question exactly regarding Kabul. Lots of difference of opinion on this within India. Uh, both Brigitte Bhosle and I are uh, hardcore uh, counter-insurgency and counter-terror people, right? <laughs> and uh, we have learned some certain principles in our experience uh, of handling this in India, Sri Lanka, maybe I, I've handled some of it in, in, South, in, in Africa and places like that. Broadly, we apply those same principles. But Afghanistan definitely is a different kettle of fish. All the principles cannot be applied. If I just apply the normal format I would say that the most difficult part of this campaign is actually the fight for the cities. In the fight for the rural areas, uh, the Taliban has been carrying out ambushes, they've been using IEDs uh, and things like that, unconventional tactics of striking and disappearing. And um, uh, I agree, an army like the Afghan National Army, which is essentially a conventional army, may be not very attuned to that kind of a thing. Now, when it comes to fighting in the built-up areas, fighting in the in the cities, I'm not sure whether the Taliban can actually get entirely get the better of uh, the uh, uh, ANA. Uh, although a lot of people who are experienced in Afghanistan tell me that uh, actually the Taliban has a very different way of functioning. When they when they want to take over a certain area, for example, a certain Mohalla of Kabul or Kandahar or some place like that. All they do is actually send out a lot of money and they buy that, buy the piece there. Right? It is a, a large-scale bribery done through the opium trade and done through other things and things like that. And that they don't actually go into battle to do it. I don't know how far true this is, but um, only time will tell us. But if I broadly apply the principles of war fighting, what one here learns about things, the Taliban is uh, definitely weaker in terms of uh, their heavy weaponry capability to penetrate these cities, uh, to hold the areas that they have captured in case they do capture, right? And to, uh, to be able to beat off the Afghan National Army, which is equipped reasonably well. It has got its own aircraft and uh, the, the Americans are still backing them to an extent. Uh, I'm not sure how much are they backing them in terms of air power because uh, there is there are no airfields at the moment uh, under their control. But possibly some kind of an air power from the fleets which are deployed in the Indian Ocean, they could always have an outreach up to, up to Afghanistan. So th this is the broad thing at the moment and we cannot really say as to who is going to emerge the final picture. Interesting, sir. Uh, Brigadier Rahul, sir, I'd like to ask you, sir, a lot of people comment on the virality and General Hasnain also mentioned that will they be able to actually run over the Afghan National Army is a big question. 
a lot of people question the virility and the fighting spirit of that Afghan National Army. We've also seen certain videos. I'm not sure if they're true or not, but we have seen videos of their commanders and their uh, you know seniors being bribed and asked to surrender and stuff like that. May I request you to comment on this particular aspect, sir? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very important issue which you are touching up upon, and this is an issue which we are seeing a lot of. Uh, stories which are coming to us that these Afghan National Army personnel have, uh, you know, sort of uh, walked away or ran away to Pakistan, to T Tajikistan, and to various other countries. Actually, we don't actually know uh, how what circumstances were there uh, under which these people have gone away. That is point number one. So it is not fair on us to comment on a professional armed forces uh, to what circumstances and in what way they have gone away. I would not like to comment on that. Let's leave that. Uh, aside. But the fact remains that creates the doubt and the doubt is what I think you are trying to address that will they be able to stand up and fight? Right? That is the exact question I suppose you are uh, uh, trying to address. The way I look at it, the presently the Taliban has been able to gain or so called seize the areas which are in the outlying uh, areas of Afghanistan where the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces were pretty weak. They were in penny pockets. They were not deployed as a cohesive large groups who can resist such attacks. So in that sort of a situation, and particularly when your lines of communication have been virtually cut off, when the air support which you are normally getting when the United States and NATO forces were there, they were getting a huge amount of air support to the various outlying posts as well. That has also cut off. So under those circumstances, the uh, fighting capability of these troops definitely goes down. Secondly, as General Hasnain has very rightly pointed out, the money factor may have also played a role. Third is the uh, importance of the information warfare. Now, the Taliban has been very adept at the information warfare. So what they do is before they want to go and capture or seize a particular area, their agents are already on the ground trying to influence, as we call in military terms, preparation of the battlefield. So they try to influence the local leaders as well as some Afghan army personnel, because after all, some of the uh, Afghan army personnel also have their akin in the Taliban. You know, it's like it's quite normal to do that. So they try to influence these persons and ask them to give up. Now, this is the manner in which the Taliban, I suppose, has been able to seize a large amount, a large quantum of area. Uh, they claim 85%, uh, but my own assessment, and this has been made by various other people, also, could be around 40 to 50% only. But that, the information of warfare aspect assumes much importance. Now, whether the Afghan army will be able to stand up and fight is a question which, which we are addressing, and we, I, I do believe that they will be able to stand up and fight when they are in a cohesively uh, defending and areas which they are of important concerns to them. For example, yesterday there were attacks in three areas, Herat city, uh, the Lashkarga and Kandahar. The Afghan defense forces have uh, comm commendably uh, rep uh, repelled those attacks. The Taliban has not been able to succeed in that. So the objective has to be very, uh, you know, something which is very dear to those people. The most, more importantly, the unity of effort or the unity of leadership. This is a principle of war, I would say. The unity of leadership is not there, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, right from the top line to the bottom, uh, including the military leadership. If there is unity of leadership, and in Kabul, unity of leadership in the Afghan force and the, the other, uh, the subordinate formations, the Afghan national armed, armed forces are going to stand up and fight. The special operations forces of the uh, uh, special forces of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces, I believe they are one of the best in the world, and they are the ones which Taliban is most worried about. So this, uh, by relying on what you call the extraordinary, Sunzu says you should fight with the extraordinary. If the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces are able to unify the leadership, they are able to use the correct strategy and tactics. There is no way Taliban can make any breakthrough now hereafter. And they also require a tremendous amount of international military support, uh, such as the US is talking of over the horizon support or whatever. 
a large amount of military aid and assistance has to be pumped into the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. In what way it is done is something uh, which will have to be done by the people on the ground. But these are the few factors for resistance of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. And let's not assume that they are going to collapse in six months and one year. This is, I think, speculation which is playing into the hands of the Taliban. Sorry for the long response, but I think that's the way it is. I think you've put it across pretty well, sir, because it's a it's a two-way street either ways. But if the Afghanis, Afghan National Army does get its act together, I think it's going to be a very, very tough road for the Taliban moving forward. As General Hasnain also pointing, pointed out, capturing the centers, you know, which they are really, really, which are important for uh, the rule of the country. General Hasnain, sir, would you be able to actually now break down the loyalty of the Taliban towards Pakistan, which is, uh, you know, a player of all sorts um, in this card table. And would the Taliban or the Pakistanis be able to push the Taliban enough to guarantee the security of the Chinese, who is another player coming in, and their investments and their money? See, Adi, uh, I will speak exactly from where Brigitte Bhosne left off. In fact, that was the issue which I was going to speak about. And that is uh, Pakistan's role in the current environment. We are, then we will talk about Pakistan with the Taliban subsequently and with China, the entry of China, in case the Taliban happens to control and rule Afghanistan. The first part is the current environment. I think the Taliban, which is still, the leadership is still sitting in Pakistan and probably handling and controlling things from there, uh, is still dependent upon Pakistan to a great extent. It is dependent on Pakistan. A lot of people ask this question, where does the money come from with the Taliban? Right? And I, I always tell them, well, part of the money obviously comes from the huge truck trade, the Golden Crescent and things like that. But a major part of the job, chunk of the money also comes from Pakistan to assist them in the, in, in, because uh, their interests are absolutely hand in glove at the moment. So you can't discount the Pakistani factor. The Pakistani factor, the moment you see that the Taliban is uh, not making headway, it is uh, militarily not achieving what it is meant to be achieving as per the Pakistanis, then the Pakistanis are going to push in probably more efforts on their side. What is reputed is that 10,000 fighters have already gone from Pakistan. Some of them may be actually people under who are from the, from the uniformed forces under the garb of going as the uh, terrorists and fighters. Uh, they've also probably got the Lashkar Atoyba, the Jash Muhammad al Badr, and these groups with them, who all of them who will probably gain some more experience in, in Afghanistan. So while this battle is going on, and while we are backing the Afghan National Army, no doubt, the armed forces, and uh, you know, hoping that they will hold on, but the, the whole um, affair is going to get extended because of the backing which the Taliban has got from Pakistan. There is no doubt about that. Right? Now that backing seems to be going up to a greater level because of the Chinese having it. And the Chinese looking upon this area as potentially uh, the area of the new great game, which is, uh, which if integrated, you know, Central Asia, Afghanistan, North Pakistan, this area, if integrated is entirely to the interest of China, as far as the Belt and Road Initiative is concerned, as far as all other aspects of energy management are concerned, as far as the aspects of ideological management is concerned to prevent the ingress of any Islamic ideologies into the, the Xinjiang area and things like that. So it's entirely to the interest of China, all this that is happening. Once, if the Taliban comes to power with the assistance of, let's say, the Pakistanis and the Chinese to some extent, I am not so sure as to how much are they going to play ball with them. Because it's a question of, as what we were discussing in the beginning with the Muslim, how much has the Taliban changed? Uh, uh, the Taliban may just perceive that uh, it is, becomes the actual flag bearer of uh, Islamist, obscurantist, radical ideology. Right? Uh, uh, Saudi, we are seeing a downscaling of Saudi Arabia. We used to always look at Saudi Arabia as the leader of the Islamic world. We are seeing Saudi Arabia absolutely quiet on this whole issue of Afghanistan. The last time you found Saudi Arabia, UAE and Pakistan were the three nations which had recognize the Taliban. This time two nations are missing. The UAE is missing and the Saudi Arabia is missing. Only Pakistan happens to be there. 
the Taliban may just be just be emboldened by all this and imagine that this entire thing can be taken to a higher level. And that is where the problems are going to arise. And that is where the shackles which the Pakistanis and the Chinese may wish to impose on the Taliban may not really succeed to that extent. And there may be a blowback. Now, this is what the Pakistanis are actually fearing the most. Because they also have got the Tehrika Taliban, Pakistan, the Lashkar e Jhangvi, and all such of Chinese groups within Pakistan. And they don't want these groups linking up and getting the support of the Taliban. So this is developing into a very interesting affair. And uh, I would say that uh, much that the Americans are hoping that this area will stabilize after their departure and that they can focus their attention completely on the Indo-Pacific, etc. I think the Chinese are just pulling the Americans back into this space again with all that is happening at the moment. I don't think uh, the uh, Afghanistan is going to cool down to such an extent that or uh, the whole issue of uh, Islamic uh, radicalism is going to cool down to such an extent to allow the Americans the liberty of changing the center of gravity from the Middle East, Central Asia to the Indo-Pacific. Hmm. That's very interesting, sir. Uh, Brigadier, uh, Rahul, I'd like you to take forward, uh, you know, the, the talk about the American role a bit further. And as a matter of fact, tell us what would they do in the region to coax, as they have been officially saying, that the neighbors of Afghanistan must step in and uh, help out the entire situation. They don't have very good relations with Iran. You know, they don't have very good relations uh, with the Russians who control a large part of the Central Asian republics, have a large influence in them. The Chinese, of course, is a whole different matter. The Indians, India is something that we will discuss later. But what do you think is the American role as far as tactical and strategic? Uh, how is it going to evolve in the next some time? Yeah, you see, uh, the basic issue is that, as General Hastin has pointed out, America cannot delink from this conflict zone. Because the Taliban, whether they come into power or otherwise, what's going to happen is that a multitude of terrorist groups and even terrorists, I would say, are starting to gravitate towards Afghanistan. Already we have reports that from Bangladesh people have moved, there may be some people moving from India and people from other parts of the world are already moving there. So delinking from Afghanistan is firstly, uh, from the terrorism point of view, not there. Geopolitically also, United States will not be able to delink, and that has been very well highlighted by General Aste. Now, if that be so, as you have said very correctly, the American relationship with all, in fact, all the countries who are neighbor of Afghanistan, but for India, I mean, I count India as a neighbor of Afghanistan uh, with a common land border, if you take that uh, portion which has been all in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Apart from India, uh, United States presently does not have a very stable relationship with all the neighbors. Nevertheless, I think United States diplomacy and their strategy is quite a well harmonized and well oiled in a way that now they are creating some sort of a quad. They are, I mean, quad, one quad is already in the Indo-Pacific. Now there's another quad in which you have Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan and the United States. So you're creating a sort of a regional multilateral groupings with a view to carry out your, uh, undertake your uh, diplomatic and strategic objectives. United States is already uh, into this uh, uh, trilateral plus, which includes uh, Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, it does not include Afghanistan, but it includes uh, Russia, uh, in, uh, the Russia, China, Pakistan, and now in addition, you have the United States. So through these various uh, regional groupings, and through, of course, bilateral uh, relations with countries like uh, Pakistan. Now, they have continued to have a very strong hold on the Pakistan military. Let us be very clear. Let us not uh, say that they do not have much hold on the Pakistans per se. Uh, yesterday or day before, as you know, Pakistan National Security Advisor and the ISI chief were in Washington. So they are able to also consider, apply considerable pressure, uh, diplomatic security as well as political pressure on Pakistan as well. So despite their weakening uh, of uh, engagement in the region per se, and I'll not be surprised if, that, uh, if the push comes to show, the United States and Iran may coordinate and cooperate uh, in certain spheres. This has happened before. 
in Iraq when the ISIS was in the full flow, the United States and uh, Iran, I, I, sorry, if I said Iraq earlier, it should be Iran. United States and Iran have cooperated and they are commonly they have defeated uh, the ISIS uh, in a much cohesive manner. So these are, you know, in, in international relations, there are only one, uh, one say there are only people think only of the possibilities. And the, if, if the US feels that you have to stay there, they will work out, uh, you know, ways and means to do that. And they have got the resources to do that. Diplomatic, political, military, as well as economic. For example, economic tool is a, one of the biggest tools that the US has got, particularly related uh, to uh, the International Monetary Fund and uh, the World Bank and these uh, issues, which they are able to sort of uh, twist the, the arms of countries like Pakistan, etc. So with these leverages, I think they will try to sort of gain not be weaned away from this area. And if you look at China, uh, China may be, I would say, the fourth empire, which if it goes into Afghanistan, it may be the fourth empire which will uh, bite the dust if it, if it goes. But Chinese are, I think, a bit smart because they always believe in Sun Tzu's strategy of, uh, you know, winning without fighting. So they won't uh, try to go get directly involved in that. So uh, in that sense, yes. But you, United States, I think, has got the tools and they will be using these tools uh, whether they are effective or not, I'll not be able to comment at this stage, but they will use the tools. Interesting. General Hassan, I'd like to ask you a uh, you know, question which is going to be close to all of our hearts because uh, Pakistan, again, uh, has, has been mischievous, if I may you know, use that. It's, it's the naughty boy in the class. And uh, it, it has been be able to learn the grey zone operations and the grey zone ways of work very well. Now, of course, being tutored by the master himself, uh, the Chinese. What tricks do you think that the Pakistanis have up their sleeve with regards to Afghanistan, sir? And that's, a, that's a very interesting question. And that takes me back to uh, 1980, 79, 80, I think, when, when the Soviets uh, entered into Afghanistan and uh, the Saudi-American plan uh, with the resources was thrust upon the Pakistanis and the Pakistanis took the lead. Uh, the Pakistanis, if you remember, were already involved to some extent in Punjab, in the Indian Punjab, but switched the moment uh, the avenues opened up in Afghanistan, their so-called strategic depth, they of course put all their focus that side and that's how Punjab was uh, left to be handled to a lesser extent. But the kind of experience they gained, uh, I think the, movie, the, the famous book, uh, The Bear Trap, bears it out as to what are the kind of experiences that they really got there. And actually all those experiences that they got there were put together and uh, utilized as a part of the conflict initiation and progression which took place in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So your question is very, very relevant that since then they've had experience of Afghanistan of the 80s. They've had experience of uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir for 30 years. They've had the experience of the Americans now and working in conjunction with them, not so much to their interest in Afghanistan. So with all this put together, Pakistan's propensity and capability to, to actually have the capability to fight gray zone is way up, very, very high. And my interaction with the Pakistani senior officers does reveal to me many times that they think out of the box. They don't think in straight lines. Uh, maneuver is part of their thinking. Very unfortunate thing that uh, in India, for example, a lot of people relate, and I'm sure Peter Poste will agree with me, that they relate maneuver warfare to only the mechanized forces. Not realizing that the greatest area where you we can use maneuver is actually counterinsurgency and in, against terrorist operations and things like that. Right? So the Pakistanis are very good at Baruma. And uh, they, they can combine their intelligence, they can bring in information, the information domain, they can, they can exploit to a very great extent the cultivation, understanding of culture. You see, being in the backyard of Afghanistan, or rather with Afghanistan being, being in their backyard as they imagine, uh, Knowing their culture is very important. And I don't think there are too many people in Afghanistan today who understand Afghanistan culture in the manner in which the Pakistanis understand it. Right? Because uh, a mirror effect of that is in the Khyber area itself. That's what, right. 
So given all this, this is a major advantage that Pakistan has. And you are very right. They would be looking at all kinds of manipulations going on at this particular time. They would have already perhaps penetrated, infiltrated uh, elements into, into Afghanistan to a great extent, besides those 10,000 fighters who are actually uh, upfront fighters. But there are lots and lots of people who have infiltrated inside influence of money, influence of drugs. This is all, all going on at the same time. And the interesting part is that uh, Iran uh, also in Tehran, there were talks going on of the Taliban <coughs> with Tehran. Uh, there are reports of uh, Hazara uh, chiefs being appointed within the Taliban, in which, which somehow, somehow tends to show us that as if the Taliban is reaching out to some of the Shia minorities also. And this is all tactical. This is all tactical. I don't think that ta the, the Taliban is changing colors in any way to start uh, looking at the Shias in a very positive uh, light. But all this is a part of the tactical things, maneuverings which are going on. In, in The moment a big power leaves an area and a vacuum is created, until another major power comes in, you'll find smaller elements from all over it will make lots and lots of efforts. But uh, no one is in a stronger position to do this than the Pakistanis. And we may not be able to put our finger to it at this moment to say how exactly it will happen. But I've just explained to you the domains in which all this will play out in the next few months. That is very interesting, sir, because that just tells us that the Pakistanis have, and as you've mentioned, they've got their agents on the ground trying to do whatever it is that their plan is. So that means the infiltration of Pakistan within the Afghan, Taliban, and as well as some uh, strong decision makers within the society there is pretty high. Brigadier Rahul, I'd like to ask you on ethnic lines, sir. You know, uh, General Hasnain also mentioned that there is Saudi Arabia has been quiet. And that's very, very interesting to see because, you know, anything destabilizing in this particular region, Saudis are one of the first people to come out and say, he also mentioned about the Iranians, uh, ethnically, absolutely the opposite, which are trying to talk to them or whatever it is that they are trying to do there. There's another ethnic group, which are the Uzbeks and, you know, the Uyghurs. There's, there's a whole lot of uh, mix and match there within part Afghanistan and around it. How do you see the situation playing out, sir? So, you see, the very important uh, issue in Afghanistan is, uh, is the yeah, ethnic issue. Now, two things we have to understand. Firstly, when it comes to the outside, uh, uh, the uh, influence outside powers, etc., the Afghans come, become united. There was a theory which was floated that let's divide Afghanistan in, in two parts, the north and the south. The north being the Tajiks and the Uzbeks as you, and the Turkmens, as you call the south being the Pashtuns. But the Afghans completely rejected this theory. Even the Taliban uh, possibly rejected this theory. I don't so the point at issue is, this is the external approach. However, internally, all the ethnic communities are intensely divided. And it's not that the Taliban is also united or the Pashtuns are united. The Pashtuns are also very ethnically, very different Pashtuns, uh, di divisions are there. Whether it is the Gilzai Pashtuns and or the Pashtuns such as in Kandahar or the pa Pashtuns who are there in uh, what is uh, known as the coast. And that belt from Zadran belt, as it is known, from where the Haqqani clan comes. So there are different divisions in the Pashtuns themselves. And the, within the Taliban also, there are divisions as far as the ethnic group goes. The major division, as we know, is between the Tajiks and the Pashtuns as of now. But this division is only self-created by the Taliban. We know the Afghan uh, the, the government today is a mixed government. All communities, all uh, have been very uh, intermeshed. There are, of course, conflicts in that. Political conflicts will always remain. Who doesn't have political conflicts? But it has been intermeshed. Now, the Taliban is likely, when it comes in, it is likely to create divisions within the ethnic communities. And those divisions are going to be very, very harmful for the country as a whole. They, the Taliban, as it is, are against the Hazaras. Now, Hazaras are a very important community in Afghanistan. They are the most educated and the community which is uh, participating in a lot of government jobs, uh, as also they are Shia. So the Taliban ha has been known to have targeting the Shias. And much more importantly, the ISIS, 
which is also has a footprint uh, in uh, Afghanistan and it will likely to grow, they'll also come into the ethnic divide. And that is how they'll try to create the rifts between the ethnic communities and try to create uh, the divisions. So far, we have seen the Afghan government and the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces have been very well united and they have been posing a united front. Now, if this division permeates into the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, because earlier there was a, a, a mismatch because there were more uh, of a particular community, community that is Tajiks, which the, uh, the Pashtuns resented. Now there is a, a little bit of better balance has been achieved, that's what I say. But the Taliban may also like to exploit this division and that will be the most dangerous aspect. So the division, divisive element in this is the Taliban. It's not the Afghans themselves. The Afghans themselves would like to stay united, but the Taliban would try to create divisions for their own advantage. Another aspect which is uh, divisions is between the modernist elements, which are uh, the huge class has grown in Afghanistan, which is a modern, uh, out, with a modern outlook. And you have the regressive outlook, as very well highlighted by General Hasnan, the obscurantist outlook, which will be portrayed by the Taliban. Now, there is going to be a clash, and this clash has already started. The Taliban has started assassinating specifically those, even the uh, moderate, you know, religious leaders, moderate mullahs in Afghanistan, they started assassinating them because they want to start eliminating them one by one. So, this is another divide which is likely to come up and which is going to cause a much uh, loss to the people who are, you know, uh, who are humanists, who are moderates, and who are going to be modernist in their approach. So these multiple divides are there and I, I believe that Taliban is the one which is going to create this divide in the future and that's what we have to watch out. Thank you, sir. That's, that actually puts a lot of things in perspective. General Hassan, sir, before I come back uh, to both of you actually on the question of what India needs to do, I'd like you to take this particular topic forward ideologically. You know, what is uh, going to happen within Afghanistan, sir? Uh, see, Adi, uh, I think Bhikram Bhoshka has already, in fact, touched upon this particular aspect. But uh, yes, the whole issue of uh, radical uh, theological kind of, uh, you know, faith, which the Taliban has been exposing all these years, will this continue in the same manner or not? He's very correctly saying that already the targeting of the modernistic uh, uh, the middle path uh, a clergy has already started, etc. What the Taliban will probably perceive is a competition from the ISIS. And the ISIS did enter, you are, we are aware, two years ago, the ISIS entered into North Afghanistan. Some elements had gone from Kerala, if you remember, from Kerala also about 27 people from a family had gone all the way there and to, to fight for them, for the ISIS. Uh, the ISIS obviously gravitated after the Middle East, after this loss in the Middle East. It experimented with Philippines. Uh, it experimented partially with Bangladesh, but uh, is, is, has settled primarily on uh, focusing itself on Central Asia. And uh, the prime reason for it is, is the, the money factor. The ISIS will always go where the money is, right? The money factor, the drugs part of it, the energy outlets available in Turkmenistan, that's a country which is very, very vulnerable to a, to a group such as the ISIS, right? So ISIS is attempting to get into Afghanistan, North Afghanistan, from there make access into Central Asia, the various republics uh, out there. But, and this is the main prime reason why the Russians are so concerned. Otherwise, the Russians have really no major concern. Their major issue is the spread of this ideology into Central Asia, and thereby into the, um, the Islamic areas of uh, Russia, that is Dagestan, Chechnya. There is an 11% Muslim population within, within uh, Russia, which worries them all the time, right? So this, the, uh, this particular aspect of ideology is very important in the larger sector of uh, geopolitics of Central Asia and the new great game. The ISIS today is at the moment not relevant because they don't appear to be making too many noises. But the ISIS is known to be an element which knows how to keep itself quiet. How it emerged in Sri Lanka on the 18th of April, if you remember 2019, out of the blue. And therefore, this could always not be expected in Afghanistan in some place where the ISIS may suddenly emerge. And the Taliban, they are not the friends of Taliban. Right? The ISIS will become the third element 
it will become a triangle of fight in that particular case right so in fact which will create even more confusion and turbulence within uh, the geopolitics of Afghanistan. It's a scary world out there, sir. That's one thing I can say. And, <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll take a lot for one to actually picture the entire story on a, uh, on a sheet of paper or, you know, in a conversation because it's, it's murkier as the day is progressing. So for my last part of this wonderful talk with both you gentlemen, I'd like you both to actually uh, discuss what India should do. Um, there have been talks about and suggestions about various different aspects that India should touch upon. Uh, what should we do going forward in terms of Afghanistan, sir? Brigadier, may I request you to start, sir? Actually, General Hashdair is the right person to start, but I'll just, uh, you know, uh, give a few points. He studied this, I think, in much greater detail. Nevertheless, you see, the point is, uh, firstly, I don't believe that uh, India has no options at present in Afghanistan, despite Pakistan trying uh, its best to sort of negate our presence, etc., etc. The major challenge for uh, India is, uh, as I mentioned uh, offhand, that we, our major challenge is how to protect uh, the people who are already there, our Indian citizens as well as the thousands of Afghans who have studied in India and who are uh, sort of uh, being, uh, who have got affinity towards India. And I mind you, it's, it's across, you asked me in the last uh, segment, the ethnic ethnicity, but the love for India is across all the ethnic communities. The, the Pashtuns, uh, they, they imagine the, the, that uh, Taliban being a Pashtun, but still the Pashtuns, we have got a lot of friends amongst the Pashtuns as well, as well as the other ethnic communities as such. Now, how uh, the Taliban is going to definitely try to target these people and uh, their rogue elements particularly. Whatever the Taliban in Doha may say, but the rogue elements will try to target and India will have to see how best these can be secured as, as well as the assets of uh, the Indian assets which have been created. Uh, I think they will also like to target those assets. Uh, hopefully, those assets are the bigger assets are so large that they won't be able to cause much damage to them. They try to fire rockets at Salma Dam and all so on. Because, and as well as the parliament building, the, these are the monuments of Afghanistan, the historical uh, the monuments which have been created for the democracy in Afghanistan. And the Taliban is anti these, uh, these uh, you know, institutions. So I think these, two, these are the factors which Taliban, of course, is all going to be instigated by Pakistan. Pakistan was already officially Officially, they were having a laugh. The Pakistani military, uh, ISPR, were having a laugh that, look, this is what has happened to the India's uh, so-called development aid and assistance in Afghanistan. So how we are going to protect it and how we are going to do it is, uh, I'm sure the, the, the much thought is being given to that and things are also hopefully moving on the ground. And towards that end, I think uh, engaging with a number of uh, regional countries, which we, we have started now, like Iran and Russia, who have been our traditional Partners in Afghanistan, a strengthening of that axis deserves to be uh, deserves more attention. Central Asian republics are another option which have United States has been. Uh, we have been uh, uh, partnering in United States uh, or in Afghanistan in all its ventures so far. So I think we have to use uh, multiple options uh, to ensure that our interests are secure and our interests are the interests of the Afghan people. Let me put it that way. The assets which you have created, the development which we have carried out, the democratic culture, which are, these are assets for the Afghan people. The Indians are not as much going to uh, partake of these. So preservation of those assets, preservation of the people, so that the, the Afghan uh, people per se benefit. And towards that end, I think we have to uh, engage. And to a small, uh, to some extent, engagement with the Taliban. Uh, these engagements are something which uh, in the uh, international relations cannot be seen as out of context. These happen between the agencies and the uh, even the adversaries from time to time. So uh, uh, engaging does not mean that we are going to partner Taliban or we are going to abandon the Afghan government. That is not the objective and intention at all. Uh, so the narrow focus for engagement could be this. Later we'll see how the situation develops. But uh, this is the way I look at it. Uh, the Indian approach could be in Afghanistan. And I'm sure uh, General Hasnan would be able to throw much better light on this. Thank you. Over to you, sir. 
Yeah, um, I think uh, I can't disagree with the regular Bosley on any issue which he has said. In fact, I will only substantiate it and add further to it. Uh, I think the, the, the rule we have to create in our mind is uh, no confrontation, more engagement. This is not a situation where you confront anyone because the situation is so uncertain, right? You don't create enemies out of the blue for nothing. Uh, and you don't start looking at the situation from a black and white angle. This is classic gray zone where you've really got to, you know, go through this whole process looking at different options in every domain. And therefore, what Mr. Bhosle said is now uh, being in conjunction, in engagement with different regional countries, Iran being a very important country, Russia being a very important country. The fact that uh, Secretary of State Blinken was here uh, spending almost two, two and a half days in Delhi, very, very important talks which took place there to get a clear understanding. We, we should not feel estranged in any way that the United States is looking for a quad one or a quad two or something like that. And that we have been left out of it. That Uzbekistan, Pakistan, are the one kind of Afghanistan are the countries which are being looked at for that particular quadrilateral. No. These are very, very narrow things to look at. The Americans are working on a certain strategy. The Americans have definitely got Indian interests in mind also. Although I know the Americans are very, very famous for only following the American interest and nothing else. But in this case, we have to trust nations. We have to trust some nations. And I think, therefore, the fact that we have assisted Pakistan, Afghanistan for all these years through $3 billion worth of, of soft power and things like that, this is the time to actually now use that, use that goodwill with the people. We go back to the old Kabuliwala. It starts from the Kabuliwala, and that is the kind of perception that people have of Afghanistan and India, and that's the perception that the Afghan people have about Indians. Benign good, friendly, friendly people, right? Very fierce when it comes to uh, loyalties and friendships, right? These are the kind of things which will continue to work. I think as far as the Taliban is concerned, a lot of debate is going on in India at the moment. And most people, I think, are looking at this in very black and white terms to say, we befriended the Ghani government, we befriended uh, the government of national unity. How can therefore we be talking to Taliban, which is the enemy of uh, the government of national unity. But then, don't we realize that Ghani, the Ghani government itself is talking to Taliban while they are fighting. While they are fighting internally, the both of them are also engaged in talks. Both are trying to maximize the situation for themselves before they come to any kind of a compromise if they come at all. So why should we be left out of it? The Chinese are talking to everyone. The Americans are talking to everyone. The Iranians are talking to every party. Why should India tie itself in knots by saying, no, we will only talk to our age-old friends and anyone who's their enemy is our enemy. No, this kind of a thing doesn't work in geopolitics. It doesn't work in diplomacy. And uh, the earlier we learn it, the better it is that the government of India is mature enough to do it. Right? My only thing is that you may not want to keep this very transparent uh, at this particular stage. The Taliban itself has come many times overboard to say that we have said nothing against India ever. We have pointed no fingers at India ever. Why is India so animosity towards us? It had these kind of statements have come from, from um, uh, Taliban representatives. So I think we just need to assuage feelings to some extent that we are there uh, for the good of Afghanistan. We are not concerned so much about the parties. We are there for the good of Afghanistan. And whatever we had invested there, that should be safeguarded whoever be in power tomorrow. That is the kind of thing. The, of course, the Pakistanis would love to destroy the Salma Dam or anything like that. But we have to make sure of that goodwill to make to ensure that the, all these assets are maintained for the good of the people. I think that's a very wise uh, way of looking at it, sir. And both of you have put it, put it across very, very clearly that it's uh, the national interest of ours, which is in a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, and dealing with whoever is in power at the end of it, we don't, you know, choose the government in that place and we can't be interfering in uh, somebody else's issues as what we've done forever. Sir, thank you so much, uh, Brigadier Rahul and General Asman, sir, for this uh, wonderful discussion on the future of Taliban. I think uh, there are a lot of misconceptions that have been floating around in our, in the social media, in, as a matter of fact, some... Uh, 
you know tv channels as well as uh, a lot of other general talks where people are talking about the invincibility of taliban and the complete takeover or, or you know something like that where what we've done in this discussion and thanks to both of you once again is that we've broken this entire situation down we've analyzed it aspect by aspect going down to ethnicity and ideology as well their neighbors and the effects that uh, they can have the investments that they are looking at their own interests as a matter of fact the taliban what are they looking for um we've spoken about that so this has been a very whole rounded discussion um it will be interesting to see how the situation uh, you know unfolds in the next some time the first big deadline obviously is going to be the Amer- americans should officially declare themselves out from on the ground and then of course it will take uh, a matter of certain amount of time could be a couple of months could be a couple of years before the entire situation in afghanistan opens out thank you sir yeah. thank you it's been very good thank you thank you sir thank, thank you, you. Thank, sir. Thank, sir. Thank, thank you sir thank you very much sir all bye the bye. best take care bye take care